Hello, my name is Kate and this is Life, an Inside Job. This is a deliciously sweary episode, so if explicit language is not your thing, please choose a different interview. But I do have to say, this is very, very juicy. I've been a bit dazzled by Uma ever since my friend Claire told me that if I was interested in connecting with my womb, then I would have to go and learn from her. And that's what I did. And she is a force of nature. I thought I'd share this little behind the scenes snippet with you before we get stuck into the main interview. Okay. Okay. All right, look. So that, that kind of thing, swearing is fine. Rambling is fine. It goes, you know, I don't have- Can't if we need to, is that banned? Sorry, is what band? Is the word cunt band? No. no, you can say cunt as much as you like. All right then. Okay, I'm going to put my feet up, drink my tea and chat to you. And that was how we got started. Uma is a yoga therapist with a special expertise and interest in women's health. She's a mother of three and she's written four books on yoga for women, including the massive Yoni Shakti, which is now in its fourth printing and has been recently updated. She's the co-founder of the Yoga Nidra Network and has developed Total Yoga Nidra, Wild Nidra and Nidra Shakti. These are radical and creative and intuitive approaches to sharing Yoga Nidra that are absolutely gorgeous. And more recently, she's initiated the Yoni Shakti, the movement, whose purpose is to eradicate the abuse of women in yoga, to take action, to reclaim yoga as a tool for planetary healing and justice. And we stitched our conversation together as Uma Sode, and I asked her about her experience of her menopause so far, about rage and tenderness, about her childhood, and of course, about Yoni Shakti, the movement, and her top tip for a wonderful inner life. I already have envy because you are stitching. <laughs> get something to stitch? Uh, my thing to stitch at the moment is a big, um, it's like a memory quilt. So it's too big to do now. Okay. But it, it's, I, I've taken little bits of all my kids, I don't know, baby hats and the oh. cushions and the cushion that I used to lean on when I fed Bella and all this kind of stuff. And it's oh. all stitched into a quilt. And again, it was mended, it's a very ancient one from the 1970s that got mended and mended and mended, so it's some... Um... That's, yeah, that was my next project, actually. I've got my bedspread from when I was a little girl. Oh. And when I was a teen, well, when I was unemployed and I got really depressed, I made this quilt out of, like, my old school uniform dresses, which are the only stripy cottons and all my cottons. And that quilt's fallen apart, but I wanted to put the quilt and the bedspread together and then put my kids' stuff in it as well. Yeah. So I'm inspired. Yeah. I, I love it. It's wonderful. That was my first job. I used to get 50p a hem off my mum. She was an alteration hand. Ah, so you have you, you sew a fine seam. I sew a fine fucking seam, I do. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. I, I was but I was pro child labour, fucking hell. Honestly, I'd sit there. Do you know how long it takes to hem a ball gown? Yes, I do, actually. Yes. I, right. I, have, I have seamstress, um, a seamstress past as well. Mm. You do too, right? That's something in common. All right, then do you want it? You, whenever you feel like it. And how long are we going to be? Um, 40 minutes, I, I would okay. say. All right, then. That's good. So while we're stitching here, stitching here, sitting, or, or perhaps we're sitting and stitching together, yeah. we can stitch to also stitch together a conversation. Yeah. Um, and I'm really curious about your experience of menopause, Uma. We were yes. just talking about these quilts that we're making that involve that are inviting our pasts into into our present and stitching everything together and i wondered if that's part of menop your menopause as well sort of gathering in bits from your past absolutely i mean i feel that it's an opportunity to review everything we thought about ourselves everything everyone else thought about ourselves because they're like oh no you're not doing that are you or, you know what I mean <laughs> and and so it it is a bit like I mean I've always kept scraps of fabric to make it it's gonna I always call it 
my dementia quilt. I was going to sit and stitch when I couldn't do anything else. Oh, I'd forgotten how to sew by then. But, but um, yeah, I feel like there's so much by the time we get to be, you know, in our 50s, because I'm 55 now. Mm. So, yeah, I think part of my, I mean, and I feel, I always feel a bit reluctant to talk about like my menopause experience because I don't think it's finished yet I'm only on day 337 with no bleed so mm. I'm not really through I don't think mm. um but I so I feel like I'm probably midway through the process and I'm also reluctant to set a map on it do you know what I mean I'm I'm not so good at the sort of thing but yeah so I feel that I, I'm speaking from the place of being in the midst of it I would say I'm in the midst of menopause mm. <laughs> in the reviewing process yeah, and it is part only the reviewing because I think um, there's a kind of uh, I went through a stage early on which was like a desperate sense of things I had like wild and crazy things I hadn't done a bit like adolescence mm. and and that was a very urgent thing like I had to do some of these wild and crazy things like <laughs> go on tour to America with both my kids and spend ten grand on air flights and you know, like like we just went everywhere. And, I, and I'm glad I did those things, but it was very mm. urgent and it was a very teenage quality, I think, to, uh, to perimenopause. Mm. Quite kind of sexy and juicy and like like a tomato plant, putting out loads and loads of tomatoes. I like, like it was very, very, you know, and doing loads of crazy traveling. And the last five years have sort of been like that or more. But like I just sort of mm. stepped on the gas a bit, yeah. like somehow I was going to get to the finish line in a blaze of glory. <laughs> And what happened was <laughs> I got, you know, d balance disorders, you know, which is fairly obvious to anyone who was looking at the outside that that was part of my menopausal review. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there is something, my observation of my own process and other people's menopause process is there is this kind of, these opposites at play that come in. Um, and of course, we're, all, we're always... Um, played by them but they come in very strongly like this thing about right I'm going to the states with everybody now and then oh my god I can't stand up <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a big cosmic joke <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I think that for me the practice of yoga nidra is key because it, it plays with those offices all the time and I see that in my I, what I recognize is um a, a dual sense of like running out of time like going to be dead soon and then also a completely mature sense that time is very big and that things take time and that I've got like I've been working on this book for seven years it's a classic menopause book it just keeps getting bigger and it keeps getting longer and I'm like it's okay she's in her own time but at the same time so there is a kind of urgency mm -hmm. about it and mm -hmm. there's also like what can I do about it and then there's a real a set deep wisdom that's growing that I feel is really nurtured by hanging out with like my best mate who's 70 right now who lives here one of my bestest friends and I'm I feel blessed by the presence uh, the daily presence of a wise older woman in my life mm -hmm. who's like well there's time for everything Emma you know if it's important mm -hmm. there'll be time for it you know and she looks at me rushing around like a headless chicken and like and then, you know, so, so yeah, and, and I find those opposites are very, the polarity of it is, yeah. is a characteristic yeah. paradox. And the mood swings are like that, aren't they? Yeah. I hoped we were going to get to talk about menopausal mental health if we get a serious moment, because like, it's actually, that. there is massive polarity in the experience of the mood swings, like one minute, total ecstatic, high as a frigging kite, mm -hmm. and the next minute, like, you know, so some of the darkness yeah. is is very deep. Yeah. And you can get my experience of that was that that would come, you know, within a day, you could be yeah. up and right down, you know, like talk about cyclical emotional states. It was like speeded up in intensely and then really deep seasonal affective disorder got much worse in menopause for me. Mm because I was kind of really tied into the outer seasons because my inner menstrual process was kind of easing up, you know? So I just found that the mental health challenges have been enormous mm. and require vast support. And I'm fully aware of my of sisters who've not had that support, who haven't made it through. And I'm also aware as a feminist of the history of women's mental health and just how many 
menopausal and perimenopausal women were incarcerated. I mean, I, my family line is in Ireland and half of the freaking women in the institutions in Ireland would be women on the chain. She just got a little bit too wild for anyone to handle. And I've lost count of the stories of people's mothers and aunties and grannies who just somehow were disappeared off. So I'm fully aware that like to stand up and like, you know, voice those mood swings and claim that rage and ecstasy and depression is it was, I think, used to be much more dangerous mm. in that you could get shut away or, you know, not, not be able to make it through well, because it's you know, it, is, it is still dangerous. The suicide rates for women, if you're going to kill yourself, you do it in your menopause years, are very, very high. Yeah. And that is the that is where the number of people of women killing themselves is growing exponentially yeah and i i'm i'm not surprised to hear those statistics i mean just in my own circles i can see how people struggle and i also know how many people are simply women are given uh, you know antidepressants as as the option you know and that's you know and I know folk doing really good work around that people like Diane Danzabrink has worked really hard to make sure that that awareness is really clear yes. that it it's not that's just a symptom of what else is going on mm. and I also remember being really not shocked but like I, I when I discovered the proportion of the women say in the Salem witch trials you know, the actual proportion of those who are deemed to be like crazy servants of the devil and who were burnt or otherwise destroyed, large proportions. I think some, I can't remember the exact number. Somebody will be able to like 13 out of like the, the 17 of them or something like it was like most of those women who were who were tortured and killed were, were, were menopausal women and post-menopausal women because their their mental states were just like considered to be terrifying i suppose i mean either terrifying on the inside mm. for us to be in it or terrifying on the outside for families looking at that kind of level of mood yeah. swing is pretty hard to handle isn't mm. it my part of my mission is to have people understand that it's a time of sensitivity yeah um so that you know, if if a if a teenager has a has a fit and starts throwing stuff around, or a pregnant woman, we're we're kind of, oh oh yes okay, you know we'll 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 make yeah. make your environment safe and quieter so that you're not so triggered and you know everything's very kind, but um, because yeah. we don't as a culture we don't understand how sensitive and how permeable. Yeah. Women are. And also, yeah. And my sense is that when you, that was great that you gave those examples because those are times of like volatile hormones, you know, in pregnancy, postnatal recovery, and in adolescence. Mm. But, but so too is menopause. And what I observe is the difference, say, between, you know, a, a teenager and maybe someone expecting their first baby. They don't necessarily have a lot of dependence. Do you see what I mean? Like they're their own thing. And, and it, it's cool for them to shut the door and get peace and quiet and everybody will understand. But the point about a lot of menopausal women that I, that I know <laughs> is we're often in a place of being somebody who's the linchpin. Yeah. Either at work, mm. be like a supervisor or something, or in a family situation where we're the linchpin for everybody, for the adolescent kids, for the, you know, often, we, you know, because people may be having their kids later on or even those in in a in a space of caring for elders yeah and we're the linchpin and if the wheels fall off the linchpin i don't know quite what the metaphor is i'm working with there like nobody's going to stop the vehicle you just have to keep going like people are like well you can take off you can take a bit of menopausal gap gear i think it's like the skills of trying to get space but you have to take it for yourself because no other bugger is going to give it to you because yeah. everyone's riding on your back yeah. That's my feeling in my family. They're all riding on my back, as I will tell them when I have a bad moment. Mm. And, 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 you know, if I want to stop, like, what happens? You know, you might have the money to buy in help. People, mm. If I'm a primary carer, you know, it's like, you know, that means that, mean that there are teams of people helping me with the caring of my, old, my elderly dad, who'll be 92 next week, you know. But, like, 
I'm still the person coordinating all of that, you know, and I think a lot of women find themselves in their in their middle age, in their 40s and 50s with enormous numbers of responsibilities that they might not have had when they were a teenager mm-hmm. or when they were maybe having babies first or second time around. And that seems like you've got a lot on, but basically everyone cuts you a bit of slack and brings meals around to you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Or at least knit booties for the baby, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's a, like it's a different... I mean, if I'm being philosophical about it, it's like, well, maybe we have the wisdom to handle that, but our culture doesn't give us credit for that, just thinks that we're losing the problem. Really, yeah, our, our duck feet are not seen. And uh, I think the holding space, the emotional holding that we tend to do, the emotional labour that we tend to do is invisible. Yeah. And that's not seen. And no. That's not necessarily something you can delegate. <laughs> What's that thing? No, I mean, I think a lot of, you know, of, of uh, women are doing, it's not always a woman's job. I mean, people of all genders hold a lot of emotional labor, but what I observe is perhaps in families that, you know, women have had kids and they've minded partners that might be men, you know, that they've often held and organized all the emotional work of the whole family, mm. you know, from the simple things of like did you remember to call your brother it's his birthday <laughs> to, to like really deep handling grief handling the, the transitions of adolescent children and that's a combo that's quite interesting isn't it like I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are in that place I've got a, mm-hmm. an adolescent girl yeah and, you know adolescent sons and I'm kind of helping them through but I feel there's a kind of camaraderie in that maybe you know yeah I do well I, I think that there's, there's a sort of no bullshit <laughs> pact that I have with my kids it's like that we we none of us have much tolerance for um shenanigans or bullshit so we're, 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 our energy is all very focused on what, what needs to happen now you know yeah. <laughs> I, I I wanted to I one, one one thing I'm fascinated by you know doing a having a podcast means that I get to ask you really nosy questions that I wouldn't otherwise so I'm I'm very <laughs> thank you very much for offering your time is this this um polarity between your family life and your activism so you're a carer for your dad who lives well not in the same village but you know it's a drive away yeah yeah he's in Gloucester I'm in Stroud yeah yeah and you're also an activist changing the yoga world so how, <laughs> how, how the fuck does that work? And you're earning a living and holding the families. <laughs> There's these well, two, a lot of things together. Yeah. But my sense in some ways, I, I, I'm a person who models extremely poor boundaries. Do you see what I mean? Like everything gets modeled in with everything else. So the people I work with, like the activist crew and the people that were, are also dear friends. Mm. Yeah. Right? And I often find that my role in the family, I have noticed the way my work has worked, evolved through, through my life is that very often the stage of life I'm at has been the work that I'm doing. Yeah. I've you know, evolved with me. So when I was in the place of like postnatal recovery and pregnancy, I was doing a lot more work around birth. I still do it, but it's in a different way. And as I've moved through into menopause, I'm kind of conscious that I actually think but that to me in some ways isn't a polarity. For me, the activism that's always been present in my life. I mean, from when I was, I don't know, I think I read The Female Unit when I was 14. I read The Colour Purple when I was 18, when I went to America. And my, like, my first campaign to get a whole friggin' school full of, anyway, interesting New England wasps to fast to raise money for Oxfam when I was 19. That was my first campaign. <laughs> But I was, you know, I was, I was signed up with CND and I used to go on marches. So, I mean, that's been part of my, mm. of my life ever since I could talk, actually. So mm. I don't see a polarity in that. And okay. the way I run my fam- the family is kind of like a campaign. Like I've always hated everything about the frigging nuclear family. I hate it. I detest it. And I've always said in my family, my little nuclear family, nuclear family has been designed to drive women mad and I will have none of it. So we've always had fairly unusual living situations mm. like we've got three buses in our garden and various people live in them at various times we always had lodges in the house I couldn't bear that hermetically sealed insanity making experience of of nuclear family mm. I lived in you know squats and housing co-ops when I lived in London in the mm. 80s you know and shared how you know and shared a community housing we lived at, yeah and, and you know all sorts of places and and 
what I found when I got married, which I couldn't quite believe that I'd done, but anyway, it's a long story, was that I, I was there in that house, pregnant with my husband. I was like, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> we need other people to live here. So we had, we've had, you know, there's always been kind of at least two or three other adults in the house. Okay. So I've kind of tried to subvert the nuclear family from inside out, partly by never cleaning my house and partly by by seeing what could be done. And I, I did it kind of instinctively. Mm -hmm. But I feel that now the situation is that uh, that activism is actually an expression of menopausal rage. It's kind of escalated. So mm -hmm. like, and I've always operated on the fringes, the margins of the, com the commercial yoga world. I've had some powerful allies who, who profited from the success of these courses and things that I've run, but I've never felt at home in that kind of, you know, that elite I'm a bit of an oik, really. I do have a PhD. I'm fundamentally an oik who's been educated well beyond their class. And that I um, I also have an immense amount of privilege. You know, I've got a white face and a PhD. So, you know, there you go. So I'm, I, I've always been conscious of trying to use that privilege in some ways to, to agitate, mm. you know. But, oh, don't get into trouble again, Uma. Don't say anything. But, you know, I was a, tr a union activist at college. I've been members of the NUJ. I, you know, it's always been part of my life. So I don't see a polarity. So that's a very long answer. But a very I, interesting answer. But I just think that I've endeavoured to leave, lead my life in a way that, like, at any opportunity I see, where I see something that's not just, you know, in, I will call it out. And I have been doing that since I was about, I say since I could talk, it was a family joke, which was that I would wake everybody in the house up every single night with my repeated varieties of nightmares, oh. which can until I was in my 30s and it always involved me shouting myself awake and shouting everybody else awake and I always said the same thing guess what it was Kate Codrington what do we want <laughs> it was, it, it's not fair <laughs> it's not mm. fair it's not fair that's all I ever said every night well I mean I'm, I'm making a story it wasn't every night it was a lot it was enough to become mm. a family and they I had a bedroom up in the attic and I used to shout so loud I'd often wake everybody up and they go oh oh she's off again she's arguing my mum would say you'd argue with St Peter at the gates at the pearly gates <laughs> you, that child will argue with anyone and I was always known as an argumentative kind of a fuck and I used to argue in my dreams can you imagine that wow. so I just like and, and I think given this state of charge and ferment all through your life <laughs> what happened <laughs> What happened with the menopausal rage? How did that translate into your current project? And can you tell us about the project as well? Oh, oh I'd love to talk about this. We've just been interviewing for our new campaign manager. It's Yoni Shakti, the movement. So listen, I wrote this book, Yoni Shakti, which I think was a, in context of what we're talking about, it's a perimenopausal project. Mm. I actually thought I'd entered my menopause at that point, uh, but I hadn't. I hadn't, I was on the edges of it. So Yoni Shakti took me a while to write and I actually finished it in 2012. It means cunt power, I can say that in this environment. But and it's all about women, you know, the power of, of Shakti, of the of the deep feminine, you know, unfolding in each, each and every one of us. And when I wrote that book at the end of it, and it's a 700 page book thereabouts. And at the end of it, Every phone call I got, because it was kind of in the, in the, it was back in 2012, it's a long story, but it was back in 2012, I thought it was going to come out in 2012, but it didn't come out till 2014. But the last few months of it involved endless revelations of abuse of women students in yoga environments, in ashrams, in commercial yoga studios, in yoga centers, by famous gurus, all over the place. And people kept telling me these things. And they were coming up that some of the people I was working with on the book were experiencing these things. And I was like, right, let's tell it like it is. I've written 700 pages celebrating how marvelous yoga is as a tool for freedom. And look at the fuck of what's happening. And I wrote a stinking chapter called, it was all about the lagoon of shit. I said the commercial yoga world was a lagoon of shit. And, and the commercial yoga studios were like a pleasure steamer. You know those things on the Mississippi? I used to put a lot of all my... And everybody was on it having a free party. They were having a party, burning the incense, all the nice white skinny ladies having dances. And every, and what was happening was that everyone was pretending they couldn't smell the shit. And I wrote about how I jumped ship and swam for the open sea. 
Now, my publishers and, and I, I colluded with them, actually. We decided in the end that they couldn't put that chapter in because it was too awful if it was supposed to be a book about celebrating women and yoga. So what they decided to do was they edited out the really stinky bit of it, the looking of shit bit. It was it was censored, basically. But I, I colluded in the self-censorship because at that point in 2012, not many people believed me, basically. And hardly anyone believed the survivors either. And it was still... But it wasn't until 2014 where further, what really happened to me to get me fully enraged was that in 2014, the yoga organization that I had been part of for about 10 years working with, what they did a massive investigation in their ashrams in Australia and revealed serious sexual and violent abuse of, of girls and young women and children who'd been left there by their parents to be looked after. And it was horrifying. And so that happened after Yoni Shakti came out. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know that all these references I made to my beloved teachers where they were they were basically paedophiles and sexual offenders. And you can go and read the, you know, read it for yourself. So what happened as I got deeper into menopause was I couldn't actually edit the book it was too painful. And then people started to say to me, clever people that I met on my travels. I went on my travels to America and Canada and I met people like, what the fuck is this? Uma? You're preaching liberation. And look at those bastards who are in your book. So I, I really felt I had to do something about it. So the new edition was needed and I needed to write the new edition, but I felt it's not enough just to put out this book and like, you know, I have to tell people about it. So we launched a campaign. Mm -hmm. And so all the profits from the second edition of the book on that first printing went into the campaign and we ran an Indiegogo campaign that raised over 30,000 pounds, mm -hmm. twice the amount we asked for called Yoni Shakti, the movement to eradicate abuse against women and to, reclaim yoga as a tool for healing and justice so sorry to shout but so we ran the campaign and the book and the campaign were kind of intertwined in a way that's a bit complicated for people to understand but you don't have to buy the book to be part of the campaign you can get all the information I collated all the court papers and all that stuff and then I talked to my publishers and we put the frigging censored bit in the front uh, fantastic good thank god so for that. my voice my perimenopausal voice was silenced because I think in perimenopause we're willing to like play the game but by the time, like seven, nearly seven years later, mm. it was seven years later, I got to the place where I was like, actually, how do you feel about this? And it was a very powerful thing to dig out what I'd heard, because by that time, I'd heard more stories and so had everybody else. Mm. And everybody knows that it's a crock of shit or the, the power dynamics in most yoga studios are insidiously disempowering. Mm. And I, I don't like them. So <laughs> I don't work that way. Um, and so that's what we've done. We've launched a campaign and you become become a supporter of it at Yoni Shakti, the movement dot com. And you can sign up and it's a public awareness campaign intended to have a thousand and eight teachers and teacher trainers who all know about this stuff. And then we can once we've revealed it, mm -hmm. then we can reclaim yoga because it's, it's an amazing tool for liberation and it doesn't deserve to be colonized by the oppressors and the abusers, does it? It's too useful to let those fuckers keep a hold of it. Hmm. So, what what kind of response did you get from the um, from the Laguna shit? I think a lot of people knew knew what I was talking about. Actually, I mean, what really prompted me was there was a point at which, when I was working on the second edition, and um, a woman called me to tell me about some a, a really terrible case of abuse, and it became apparent as I spoke with her that the young woman that she was speaking about was in fact her daughter. Mm. And there was, I still get goosebumps all over my body. And as a mother of a daughter, there, that was the galvanizing factor. I think my menopausal rage was manifesting as the rage of all mothers. Like, no, and so the words, nobody's daughters are safe in these places. Nobody's daughters are safe. And I started dreaming in first. So the whole front end of the new edition is full of insane middle-aged rap. Nobody's daughters <laughs> are safe in these places. Nobody's daughters are safe. <laughs> so, so you can read them or the poems yourself. Yeah. And um, and so, yeah. So I think that was the galvanizing thing. It was like not just as a menopausal woman, but as an activist and as a mother. And I was thinking nobody's daughters deserve this. If all they're looking for is freedom and liberation through the practice of yoga, nobody should be harming them. Mm. Anyway. Yes, that so, gets me. Yeah. And there was something about, it, you know, Kate and. And then the fact that so many of the women who came forward to tell me their stories, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counsellor, 
Mm. I've made a lot of mistakes in how I run the campaign at the beginning because people were coming to talk to me personally and that wasn't a good idea, you know? So I think it's important to call out anyone who's listening to this and saying, well, you know, how was that doing? So what we've got is like, we have huge support from people whose professional job it is to support survivors of abuse. And so we've got resources and like, we're not, we're not a place to go to look for. for yeah, but my question kind of was, well, where do the stories go? Yeah, well, where did like you were, you were whole, you were a container. Well, I actually got really sick, to be yeah. honest. I mean, what I realized was the first um, edition of Yoni Shakti, I ended up with excruciating ear pain. I went deaf. I literally, I went deaf and I couldn't hear anything. And then over the following seven years, I developed a fairly serious set of nasty balance disorders mm. that I think quite a lot of menopausal, vata deranged women get. I haven't had a single hot flush, but I've had the most horrible benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Mm. I had to be flattened. Mm. So that's my, my menopausal kind of physical challenge has been that. But I think it was symbolic of what I heard. And a lot of the stories went into Yoni Shakti. Some women contacted me because they wanted to speak up. Yeah. They wanted their abusers named. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be in print. And I mean, I spent 10 years as a journalist. I, I you know, and my heroes were people like John Pilger, you know, who are like people who could really do good in the world by spreading news that nobody was, unpalatable news that no one wants to look at. You know, I read all Pil Pilger's dispatches from East Timor and you know, he was my hero, but like, what I was doing was putting those in the book, but that's not everybody's solution. So there've been bad situations where people, you know, will tell you information, but they don't want it out there. And then that, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? If you're the repository of many tales of suffering and you're not able to pass them to the abusers, because that's not okay. Yeah. And you're not able to put them out there because that's not okay. So I've had to, you know, we've got a good team now, but we had to learn a few lessons because it's a really very, challenging world and people have been very their lives have been ruined by these experiences mm. and many other kinds of it showed up a lot of other inequity in the yoga world like around along lines of class and race also so part of what what has happened is i would say that my awareness as a menopausal woman has been an awareness i think a lot of us get a wider picture of intersect the in the necessity for decolonial and intersectional feminism mm. so my feminism that i initially connected with as a teenager was initially white feminism you know and i was and as i kind of had the good fortune to be in america and have some great you know amazing teachers there a great new york feminist who like opened my eyes and ears to you know bell hooks and um angela davis and you know the and um Kimberly Crenshaw, who, who, you know, in the 80s, who kind of coined the term intersectionality. So I feel grateful for those teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as I've grown into a menopause, I've seen that that intersectionality is part of a, um, a decolonial effort that people like myself, with the privilege of a massive educational privilege and, 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 and the white face, means I can get angry about stuff. Mm. in a way that maybe my black colleagues are getting, you know, tone policed. If they voice that kind of rage, then they can get shut down. And, it, you know, it's, it's a, I think as, yeah, so I'm, so I'm not, I don't want to speak on behalf of anyone else, but I do want to speak that, that I think that, that I feel a degree of kind of responsibility with that privilege comes. So I wanted to use the voice and the platform. Mm. Um, and I was amazed. We ended up with over 5,000 people in this Facebook group, Kate. And we didn't have, I had no clue that was going to happen. I was just like, we want to run this campaign. We'll need a bit of money to hire a kind of campaign manager so everybody can get hold of the, I, it's an educa I'm an educator. So I wanted people to get hold of the educational materials. Um, so we, well, let's do a crowdfunder. Let's do that, you know. And then the person who helped us with the crowdfunding campaign, who I'd like to big up as the most amazing and wonderful person ever, if you ever want to run a campaign like that, you need to talk to her and her name will come to me. That's another menopause thing. The name goes out of my head and it will come back to me. You know her because she's worked a lot with Red School. It'll come. Huh? It will come back to me. I'm going to big her up. Hmm. But she said to us, listen, why don't you run a Facebook group just to give a little bit of a holding space whilst the book is coming, whilst the materials are coming, just support people. 
and we opened it up and within about three or four months there were like four thousand people in it and we're like oh. oh now we need to look after this space it's a sanctuary space yeah yeah it's a sanctuary space um so all this fierceness Sarah, of activism oh, is that her name Sarah, Sarah Jane. Jane. Sarah Jane, is it it? Sarah Jane Mortimer? Yes, Sarah Jane Mortimer. Yeah, yeah. 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 she was our she was our who was Cecilia Allen campaign manager, but Sarah Jane Mortimer was the one who who kind of set us up and, and suggested that we might want to have a Facebook group. And then I went, <laughs> now what happens? I mean the camp, somebody to mind it. We needed to draft in sisters who came in to volunteer and everybody ended up with a job, you know. <laughs> so there's yeah. this real rage and force for change and a refusal to be shut down and at the same time menopause calls us inwards and calls us to be quiet so how the hell does that work um that is a challenge isn't it i have to be fully aware that i am a person who really i i mean i love solitude people think it's hilarious because i never stop talking but like, actually, I really like being on my own. And what I found is that the necessity to have a daily rhythm really emerged. I have run off to Ireland periodically. <laughs> it's a very wild place where I go and stay on the edge and like try not to talk to anyone apart from the ocean, which I go and get in. So I try to balance a sense. And I'm not a very balanced person. <laughs> like, well, I am. I'm grounded. But I think if I'm properly grounded then the, the imbalances can be kind of absorbed in a way the mm. practice of yoga nidra is really key to me mm. i have a very lively dream practice so i'm devoted to my dreams so i have an incredible my inner world is so much more extraordinarily fantastic <laughs> than the outer world that i retreat into that and tell, people, me your, tell me about your dream practice what does that mean well, all I do is I pay a lot of attention to my dreams. Mm. I talk to my ancestors in my dreams. Um, I share dreams um, and I write them all down. I have done ever since I was, ever since I had the most amazing dream of pushing Chairman Mao in his Green Army uniform in a wheelchair around my girls' school <laughs> until he made me scream to stop. It was a lucid dream <laughs> where I made a choice never to get faster and faster. So I've been having dreams like that my whole life. Last one I had was wrapping up Saddam Hussein like he was I was swaddling him like a baby. Yeah. No, not Saddam Hussein. It was um it was the Ayatollah Khomeini was in my dream. <laughs> anyway, so I, I have a morning practice that is quite sacrosanct and I get quite bad tempered if I don't get to okay. do that thing. Mm. My own practices, and so I do have a lot of internal quiet practices okay. that to do poetry and dreams and rest and lying on the earth and of course lovely nidra and yoga nidra without which i think i would probably be have gone out i always joke i would have gone up in a puff of smoke a long time ago it wasn't for yoga nidra so i tend to practice yoga nidra at least twice a day mm -hmm. and then i find when i'm sharing yoga nidra i have to be still and focused on other people and although that's a public thing it's a very intimate thing and so I, I find those, my work is actually requires for me to be really present in my inner world. Yes. Because otherwise I can't authentically do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. you have to be partially in a nidra state to deliver one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, as you well know. <laughs> and I start rocking. <laughs> yeah. But I start, I don't do this kind of thing. Uh, I, yeah, I'm a rocker. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other, so are you able to harness this tenderness and this care for the world for yourself and this well, do you can oh. you can you do you inter uh, that's a very very personal question <laughs> um, you can tell me to knob off <laughs> but it's all it's all going out there yeah but can you because you are so, I mean, so fierce. So I, you were, you have been really, really kind to write a foreword for my book. And when you first wrote, wrote it, you sent me the most explosive, filthy email I've ever had in my life because it was too, well, I mean, we can't say who it was, but it, I quoted somebody twice 
And I think he said, you don't need that fat fucking white bitch. <laughs> I'm not. It's like, okay. You also, sent, you also sent a very sweet apology. Yeah. I, that was the most fierce email I ever had. And I also witnessed you being the most tender, tender, tender and loving heart orientated big hearted person and I was think I was enjoying one of your nidras on uh, Facebook this week and I was thinking god can Uma reply that to herself well the thing is <laughs> I don't think you can give that stuff out unless you you do do it to yourself do you know what I mean like my sense is that I receive a lot I feel like I receive a lot from I don't want to get too kind of um because I mean it is an intimate and personal question so I could talk to you about like self-love practices and you know crystal wands and coconut oil and that kind of thing but I'm not going to do that because there's a lot of other people who can do that much better than me but I will talk to you about the fact that I feel I receive a lot in the sense that I feel very mothered okay I I feel well mothered I mean I'm not just talking about a childhood experience of that my mother is a very fierce person okay. who in some ways is terrifying and it was a very terrifying experience having her as the mother but she would defend us to the hilt mm. like she would go down to the school gate and get hold of bullies by their collars and like she transformed the school culture because I came home with a black eye because I had an experience of but she did that out of tenderness to me. And everyone else was freaking terrified of my mother because she would effing blind and she was Irish. So she was a bit, you know, it's my first experience of kind of racism, really, because people really did, didn't like her. But my sense is that I had an experience as a child of being well mothered by a very fierce, fierce person who would defend me to the hill. But she would also shout and yell at me. Do you know what I mean? Like that. Mm -hmm. But I, and the, the, the psychology of that is one thing or another. But the, the, the idea, I mean, I have the mother, Mahavidyas behind me, the fierce wisdom goddesses. And there's an experience I have of, of the presence of Ma Gali, who's time herself. Nobody gets away from her. Or nobody's getting out of here alive. Like, she's onto you all, you know. And I feel her as the tender presence. And I think that paradox is deep in how I treat myself in some ways, like that I can receive so much love from the earth I love that I just I, you know I'm I, I live out in the country and I love the earth and the ocean I feel them as my as my mother and I also feel the presence of Carly as an incredibly fierce defender of the vulnerable so I often feel quite vulnerable but I never really feel scared of anything mm. because <laughs> my intimate experience of mothering is of somebody who is freaking terrifying and like, you know, you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of her. So I think that somehow about that, I'm going around in circles here, but my tenderness to myself is often marked by quite fierce boundaries, you know? Like I, I'll take myself very far away or I'll need to be on my own for a bit. Mm -hmm. Or I actually feel an embodied connection to the fierce mother. And, and that's not unusual. I think anyone who's got any kind of devotional connection to the dark mother, it's like she in some ways is terrifying she you know she's the one who's got you know a machete and and a seven heads and you know all that kind of thing but like a lot of people talk about her as the most beautiful tender if you surrender to that mm -hmm. I feel that that's my experience her great wings come around me so I have a kind of like a sense of psychic connection to fierceness that is tenderness I don't think they're separate yeah yeah oh, wow. so, that's so, that's so moving to hear you speak about that yeah, no, I, that's how I feel. I mean, I'm, I'm passionately devoted to the to the to the female to the, the this mother energy, mm. and and I do anything to, to to defend it. And as a result of that, I feel like I can be absolutely. I'm a quite an undefended kind of person. Just me, like I, said, I can be very tender to people and tell people that I love them a lot. You know, I've also lost a lot of friends in the last few years. That's made me very kind of vulnerable to grief I feel grief deeply you know really powerful fierce wonderful friends so when you're talking to me about fierce people I'm thinking about people like Colette Nolan and mm. Polly Higgins and powerful folk mm. yeah and, and Mandy you know Mandy, all these people who've just like gone on and they were fierce powerful women and they had such love and tenderness all of those people that I'm thinking of 
so I think it's it seems like a polarity, but that's only because people don't understand the deep feminine. Mm. Like it's it's fierce, isn't it? And menopause is like that too. I've experienced it as a real fierce. Like honestly, when I was ill, Kate, I I, could, I was vomiting. I couldn't even move. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't even open my eyes. It was fierce medicine. It was really strong medicine. It was like you will lie down here and you will not move. And you cannot move and you cannot open your eyes and you have to let go of everything. And I would just dip out sometimes for weeks at a time and I couldn't stand up. And and it was fierce, but it was so tender because like, you know, my family had to come and cough to me. It wasn't it wasn't great. You know, I had to be rescued a few times from places where I had to be brought home from Copenhagen in a freaking wheelchair because I collapsed. That was like my lesson of like giving it out and giving it out and giving it out. And she just took me. She was like, you can't do this. Mm-hmm. But what happened was the most beautiful, tender people, students of mine and, and people on the course came and carried me off and brought me home when I was met at the airport. So I've experienced tenderness mm-hmm. because eventually the fierceness did make me crack a bit. <laughs> but for my own good, I feel, you know, I've learned a lot from being very ill. Yeah. I'm not, but and I'm also glad that I've never. It's not terminal illness, mm-hmm. you know. It, it was like illness that could be managed if you paid attention properly. And I have huge. I do have a massive team, Kate. Mm-hmm. Acupuncturists, osteopaths, your people, people, <laughs> you know, psychics, astrologers, you name it. I've got a Good. massive team, and friends. I, I'm a very loyal person. My best friends, you know, like people I've known since I was six. Mm. I'm still friends. I don't go away. You know, I'm still here arguing with my husband that I've been married for 25 years. <laughs> I stick around. So to close our conversation, can you give me your best, what is the best thing for nourishing your inner life? Oh, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Simple. Sleep. I know that on, on the earth, sleeping on the earth. Mm. I mean, ideally sleeping naked on the earth, but like we, we live in a, a temperate climate, it's too cold. But I love to like lie down and drift off the earth and, and just sleeping in your bed mm. and like making that a sacred ritual. Like I love my, I have a lovely bed with lovely bedclothes and I just love it. I love to sleep mm. and I love to dream. And I think like I learned that if we didn't dream, we, we'd become emotionally constipated, you know, like. And it just keeps everything flowing. Yeah. Don't get, so I don't get stuck. I like I go into the ocean of sleep and dream every night with joy in my heart because I've I don't think I've ever lost a night's sleep in my life. Even when my kids were little, even when I was really depressed, even when I was anxious, even when people are out to fucking get me, I know I can sleep. Mm-hmm. My mum used to say she peg us up on our by our toes with the clothes pegs on a water line, and she goes, and that child would sleep. She, I was always falling asleep. She'd find me asleep places. So I think sleep on the earth. Mm. That's my favorite poem, you know? I changed it a bit. You know that Mary Oliver poem? She goes, I thought the earth remembered me. I love, I dreamt the earth remembered me. She took me back so tenderly. That's the beginning of it. It's lovely. Thank there you, you go. Oh, it's a pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. After our chat, I looked up the Mary Oliver poem and it's called Sleeping in the Forest. It goes, I thought the earth remembered me. She took me back so tenderly, arranging her dark skirts, her pockets full of lichens and seeds. I slept as never before, a stone on the riverbed. Nothing between me and the white fire of the stars, but my thoughts and they floated light as moths along the branches of the perfect trees. All night I heard small kingdoms breathing around me, the insects and the birds who do their work in darkness. All night I rose and fell as if in water, grappling with a luminous doom. By morning I had vanished at least a dozen times into something better. Mmm, that's so tender. Now, my friend here tells me that it's lichens, not lichens. But I always say lichens. I don't know. What about you? Lichens and lichens. Mm. And if you need support 
or you want to support the Yoni Shakti The Movement, you can find it at yonishaktithemovement.com. And the links for the Nidra training and the free Nidras and the other things we mentioned are all on the webpage. You can go and find them there. If you enjoyed listening to Uma, it would be wonderful if you left a review so other people can get a flavour of what life and inside job is about. That would just be fantastic. Or if you fancy joining the conversation about menopause, my favourite thing, you can find me over at Instagram at Kate underscore Codrington. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the fascinating episodes I have coming up for you with more just beautiful people, all of us wibbling and wobbling our way to find pockets of peace and truce as we navigate our inner worlds. Thank you.